Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. Awesome. Well, we want to introduce to you um, some very special friends of ours. Uh, Don and Angie Power have been friends of ours now for almost five years, and they uh, started a ministry in town called Marriage and Family Works. Um, it is now called Live the Life. But um, we met, I think it was almost five years ago, when they were guests on Ralph's radio show, Mind Your Own Business, and uh, we instantly fell in love with these guys and um, have been friends ever since. They are part of our church family here at The Source, and um, they have an amazing story themselves, but they have such a heart for marriage and family. And what we have seen so much is that if we can get marriages functional and operating and seeing the way God has them, um, it will affect the family. And when the family is affected, guess what? We affect society. With um, families constantly falling apart, we have this huge void. So what we want to do is we've um, asked Don and Angie today to come and talk about a topic that we have wanted them to speak on here for a while, that we know whether you're married or not, it is going to be um, just life-changing for you. It is going to be awesome. So um, before they come, we want you just to watch a video, but I want you to give them a warm welcome. What is love? Love. <laughs> what is Thanks. love? Stupid. Not stupid. It's a really hard question. <laughs> I have no idea. What That's is love? <laughs> Baby, no, don't hurt true. me. That's the question. The question is, what is love? How long do I have for this? Oh no, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> I've been married 31 years. I've forgotten. <laughs> I don't really know. I don't really think anyone knows uh, specifically what love is. This is what love is. Yeah. With all of this. We still love her. I feel like one of those little kids who's asked this question and they're like, love is the person that you share your lunch with. To me, it's something you want to die for. I love my country, I'm an American soldier, and I would die for that. My little son here is what I think of love. Yeah! <laughs> you like that, don't you? I think love is being selfless. Chemical reaction that keeps you going. Like in the movies, like I would expect it to be in the movies, like when you're just like thinking about them 24-7. And when it's there, you know it. It's a good feeling if you can sustain it. And therein lies the rub. I think it's difficult to sustain. I'm actually going through a divorce, so, but it's good. It's amicable, but 27 years we were in love. You know, by caring for someone so much, like you are putting, you, you make yourself a little bit vulnerable. It's the best thing and it's the hardest thing because love that is not returned can really break a heart, but I think that's the chance you take with love. Last time that I most vividly experienced love was the summer of 2010, and her name was Yasmin. I was 12 years old. I was not interested in boys. And I had known her for a month before Ramadan, and then I fasted for all of Ramadan. I walked in the store, and I looked at him, and I knew, I, I said to myself, I'm going to marry him. That type of thing can happen when you're confused and in love. And sure enough, many years later, we got married. There's this ideal that, especially from movies, that love has to be perfect, and there has to be that aha moment where you just, you know, and um, it wasn't like that for me. A lot of people say that love is a feeling, it's something you feel, but... It's a, a conscious choice that people make. When somebody has hurt you so many times, you can still appreciate who they are as a person. You can see past all the things that they them to hurt you. Well, especially when you screw up time and time again, because you do, but she's still there, and, and I will still be there for her. Sometimes when you take the shot and it doesn't work out, you know, you have to pack up and move on and try again. It doesn't have to work every time. It doesn't even have to work often. It has to work one time, and that's the good thing about, about love. I feel like it would, it would be less about the chocolate and cards and flowers and candy, and more about, I guess, the love. Celebrating lots of different relationships in your life. And challenge people uh, to think about loving somebody in a different way. You know, you're walking down the street and you see someone sort of, you know, 
begging for money or asking for someone and you know you just sort of you, you give. Valentine's Day would be a great excuse to share the love with everyone. Love is the reason that we wake up in the morning, there's different types of love, there's self-love, there's romantic love, there's friendship love, there's love for your community, for your society, for your fellow citizens, there's so many different types of love and I think love ideally is what, is what we do here, right? It's what we like to do here, right? I think so. Well, good morning, church. How are you? What is love? It looks like everybody had an opinion, didn't they? They all had a thought, an idea, a, uh, a way they relate to love. Uh, and that's today what we're going to talk about. I'm Don Power, and this is my beautiful wife, Angie. Hi, guys. We're just going to talk about love today. We're going to talk about uh, why love shows up and why it doesn't show up. We're going to talk about what stops us from loving. It's going to kind of be interactive with you guys today. You're going to have a little assignment to do while you're sitting in your, in your seat. So if you're online today, we want to thank you for being on live and to talk about love. And if you want to go to 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to be concentrating on what love is. So if we think about what Jesus said, right? He tells the disciples, you know, pretty blatantly, Looks, I, I need you to do something for me. I need you to love one another. And if you think about that, it's hard to do. It's easy to love the people that we love. It's a little more difficult to love those people that don't seem to be lovable. But we need to start taking a look at what stops us from being able to love one another. And so today, uh, we're going to start with just taking a look at who you are as a person and how you relate to problems. So we're going to start with who you are as a person. So if Angie and I, if you look at our relationship, when there's a breakdown and we have breakdowns, what happens is I'm the fighter in the relationship. Now, whenever, whenever there's a breakdown with people, uh, you do one of three things. You either have a fight uh, type of personality where you want to talk it out, really get louder, do whatever it takes to get your point across. Then you have those that love to freeze, and uh, my wife does that job very well. I'm the well. freezer, yes. She's, <laughs> she's the freezer. So what do I mean by freezer? It means that instead of dealing with the conflict, she goes into her turtle shell, and she hides Protective from the problem. Protective mode, Protects right? herself. Mm -hmm. And then you have those that like to flee. It could be you know, fleeing to the, uh, uh, the bar, fleeing to drugs, or pornography. Anywhere. You're, workaholics. You're just escaping the situation. You don't want to deal with it, so right. you're, you're going to flee. So just, just for today, we're going to get you comfortable. We're going to have you interact a little bit with us. Who are my fellow fighters inside of the church? This is our right. survival mode, Come right? On. With any kind be, of conflict Be proud. Come upset. on, guys, if you're fellow fighters. Not many of you. Mm -hmm. Don't I'm kind of by myself here. Right? You and Ralph can relate. Okay, yes. Angie? Okay, and then my fellow, um, just freeze, just um, try to avoid conflict at whatever cost. You go in your turtle shell. You just want to protect yourself. Be safe. Ooh, there's a lot You just more hide out and wait till the coast is clear. So, yeah, we got a lot of freeze. Okay, and then how many of there. you like to flee from the problem, whether it's just get in the car, run away? And you can do more than one. Notice that sometimes you can be freeze. I got a fleer in the back row. Fleer in the back row. Fleer in the back row. Yeah, flee. <laughs> So look, and, and you online the same thing, you know, just yeah. take a look for your own life exactly. and say, you know, which one of those three do you fall within? And then today's journey is just going to be about taking a look at, you know, where did we learn that? And then what does it take maybe to do something different? What does it take to actually do what Jesus said to love one another? You know, Angie and I have been married 22 years and the first 12 years were kind of like a Laurel and Hardy movie. You know, I'd get mad and bring a problem to her. She'd go in her turtle shell. I would get louder, hoping I'd get my point across, right? You know, I would just raise the voice. I'm sure if I say it loud enough that somehow she's going to hear me, and she would become introverted. The more introverted. he'd yell and push, the more I'd go in my turtle shell, the more I'd, you know, hide out and try to be safe, the more he'd push. So it was just a vicious cycle. Just yeah, vicious so cycle. the first 12 years of our marriage didn't go really well, uh, and we just couldn't figure it out. And why? You know, if you, if you knew Angie and I's story, we both come from very dysfunctional families. And for those of you that have experienced that same thing, like you didn't have a role model for what love is, right? So for me, I grew up with an alcoholic, abusive parents, and I just didn't know what love was. So I tried to figure it out myself. And as I went on the journey of becoming a teenager and a man, I thought, well, love must be sex, because that's what 
I don't know any difference. So I related to that's what love was. And then for Angie, as she grew up as a little girl. Yeah, so I just had, um, you know, just a, a lot of conflict. Um, mother suffered with depression, so there was always fighting and conflict. So I thought love was like, like peace, like no conflict, no fighting, that if you're not, you know, in confrontation somehow, that that was what love is, right? And there was, that's just what I thought love was. So there was a whole lot missing for me. But my idea of love was like peace, like a false sense of peace. So we married each other, and we had this great idea to raise a family and be in love, although neither one of us really knew what it was. Mm -mm. And we'd have breakdowns, and we didn't feel loved. You know, uh, I would try to love her the way I thought love was. That didn't go very well. (laughs) Trust me, man, that don't go very well. Okay, And then she would try to love me the way that she, you know, felt it was the right way, and that didn't work either. So we, we, we had a lot of breakdowns, and uh, the reason we're in the ministry now is because, you know, from our pain, we decided to do something with that, and that is to speak to people about what's missing in your life, right? Like, what's missing that has you feel like you can't love? What happens to love when we're in conflict, right? What happens to the whole concept of what love should look like when we do have breakdowns with, um, with all the relationships in our life? Because relationships are going to have conflict, that is inevitable, right? So it's just having us look at today is like what happens to love when the conflict comes in or that, um, like we've talked about before here, the bait of Satan, the offenses come in and we get triggered, what happens to love in those moments? So. And I don't want to go too far ahead of the, co- uh, of the card here, but I want to make sure that everyone yeah. in church today has this sheet, which is what is love? Because we're going to do a little love test while you're in your seat. And I don't mean to be a distraction here to you, but I want to make sure if you don't have this, raise your hand. They're handing them out here, right. We're going to hand them out to you. And there's some pens that will be underneath your seat. If you don't have a pen, raise your hand. We'll find one for you. If you're online today, just kind of go to First Corinthians. Get a piece of paper and maybe just uh, write a blank down. You'll be able to do this exercise online. And we're going to go here in a few minutes. But the first thing I want to share with you is, in order to understand sometimes what's going on in our life, we have to take a look at what's missing. And and Michael Jordan, uh, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Oh, we have someone raise their hand back here. Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, pretty much so. I mean, he's in the top five. We'll just give him that. After every basketball game, he would watch the game that he played not to see what he did wrong, but to see what was actually missing in his game, that if he could actually put that into the next game, would make him a better player. So today, as we do, we're going to be doing this exercise, we need to be start looking at, okay, what's missing in the area of love? That if I could actually put that in my game, my game of life, that it would make a profound difference in how the next game goes. And first we have to start with telling the truth about things and maybe why we're unwilling to uh, love one another as we've been called to do. So if we go to look at what is love in 1 Corinthians, I want you to consider it has two major pillars, okay? And And we all know this. We've heard it how many times? Thousands of times, okay? But sometimes knowing something makes no difference. It's actually learning how to apply it will actually make a difference. So if if love is patience, boom, there's a pillar. And love is kind, boom, there's a pillar. Those are the two foundational things of what love is described to us as. And if we don't have those pillars in place, whatever we're building is going to be a little crooked, a little not too structurally sound. But what is our understanding of that? What is our understanding of love is patient? You want to touch on that, Angie? Love is kind? Um, Well, so basically what we try to understand here is like, um, you know, patience actually, what would that really look like for us, right? So patience looks like self-control. You know, patience looks like, um, you know, starting to take some ownership or why am I triggered and why am I offended, right? You know, most of the time conflict comes in and something happens, right? And we just get emotionally hooked and we start doing that survival mode stuff, the fight, flight, or freeze, because we're just not practicing patience, you know? Um, and the thing to understand is that it's there in every, it's created in every single one of us. We were all created with patience, right? But something's happened in those moments where we get emotionally hijacked or offended or triggered or something and it just goes out the window. And it's just understanding that the one thing that's missing is self-control 
um, is, you know, some empathy, caring about what's there for the other person. And we say that patience really is ownership. It's like really like taking a look at what's going on for me instead of being reactive to the other person. And basically what, um, what patience does is it really stops the problem. If you're practicing patience first, the moment there's an offense, the moment there's conflict that comes in, the moment there's a point of impact, it is just ownership. And it's if you're just, a fighter... We don't have patience no. normally. We want to get right you, to it. Yeah. We want to deal it with the so issue. Quickly, the Bulldoze. You know, let's get this thing handled. Mm-hmm. You know, plus men, we're fixers. If you're a man and you're yeah. a fighter, we got a double-edged sword against us, right? Because we just want to bulldoze and get it fixed. And it happens quickly, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. That survival mode trigger kicks in, right? And then patient goes right out the window. Yeah. So it's just understanding, you know, that's what patience is. Patience really is the tool that's God giving us that, that stops the problem. It helps stop the reactivity. It helps stop the, the reaction that, um, that can, you know, minimize the problem at hand, right? But it has to start here. You know, we all think that, you know, I wouldn't be upset and I wouldn't be triggered if they wouldn't do whatever, right? But people are just going to do whatever they do in our lives and in our relationships, right? You know, God's giving us that ability, you know, to practice patience. And it is just that ownership and self-control. That's where most of us have to start. And we have to look at most of us aren't even trying that, right? We're just letting ourselves be, you know, taken off track and, um, and just be easily hooked and offended. So, so that's, that, of course, that's the patience part. And then the kindness, it's kind of like a one-two punch. Kindness is the other pillar. And what kindness means is that that creates the blessing. You have to have patience first to stop being so reactive, you know, and to, you know, to have some self-control and have some compassion about what's going on for you, what's going on for the other person. And then the kindness is the, you know, the one-two punch. Kindness means you're doing something. Kindness means proactive. I'm going to be proactive here to, to do an action that's going to create a blessing here. And to, you know, like I said, to, maximize, or to minimize the problem and to maximize the godly result here. So. And if you're a conflict avoider, see, my wife thought she practiced kindness Ooh. because she was not mm-hmm. aggressive in the way she wanted to handle conflict. So the first 10 or 12 years of our marriage... Look at me being patient and she, kind because <laughs> a conflict avoider is going to think that, right? Because they're not being as you know, reactive as the other person, right? So I, I really want to make sure our conflict avoiders get this concept because just because we're being patient, I mean, just because we're, you know, we're not being reactive, right? Just because we're not being easily triggered and easily offended and easily reactive, we kind of just you know, instantly, automatically go into... Um, freeze mode and kind of just still mode and, and a lot more quiet mode, right? It looks like we're being patient and kind, but again, we're going to go back to kindness really looks like being proactive, doing, doing something different. So even though it may look like, you know, we are practicing patience and kindness, right, by not being overreactive, I want to challenge the conflict avoiders that we're really not practicing kindness because we're not being proactive. We're just being stuck. We're being still and we're just kind of being stuck and there's not really much um, uh, much proactive intentionality going on. Let me give you a real life example of that. You know, if I go to Angie with a problem, right, and I want to talk to her about this problem and she's uh, unwilling to deal with it, right, and she avoids it, that's not very kind in my world. It's not giving you what you need. Okay, it's not giving me at all what I need. I can't even begin to deal with the problem with her because she's shutting herself down. So she's feeling as if she's being kind by not... Not being engaged in the power struggle, Mm -hmm. so to speak. And many times opposites will marry each other. So many times a conflict avoider will marry a fighter or a fleer. Or, you know, so you're going to have opposite ways that you handle conflict. And it's very frustrating to try and figure out, okay, what, why is this going on? Why do I always feel like I, I, I'm not being loved and, I, and I'm not being heard? And so today's journey is, is going to be about taking a look at what's missing in your game of love. What's missing in the area of 1 Corinthians that if you could actually put that into your life would actually make a profound difference in the way your friends showed up and the way family showed up. And for those of you that are married or in in deep relationship, what does it look like to have love be present inside of that relationship and have a good, healthy understanding? And so for many of us, again, if you don't know what love looked like, if it was not exampled to you, you don't know what it is. And I think that's why 1 Corinthians does such a great job in defining that. And then I think it's up to us to take a look at, okay, why am I unwilling to release these attributes that are within me? What are my reasons and excuses that I want to keep records of wrongs? What are the reasons and excuses that I want to be angry? What are the reasons and excuses that you know, I don't want to persevere? And so the test today is going to be for you to take a look at. And for married couples, I'm going to kind of set up the test. I'd like you to use this test between you as a married couple. So for instance, in my life, I could probably put my name in most places where love is supposed to be because I'm that way with many people in my life. 
in the area of my marriage, I may not be able to put my name in certain areas where love appears because of the hurts and pains and, and our past and the things I believe about my wife and believe about love. So I may have a different answer uh, for this test if I'm using it for friends and relatives and people in my life versus my wife. So the encouragement is because we believe that family is the foundation is that if today as you take this test and we tell you how to do it is that you actually look at the relationship that you have. And if you're not married, it's perfectly fine. It's still to take a look at, you the know, close relationship yeah, why, why can't you talk to your neighbor next door? What is it about you that has you not be able to love them? And so it's just some insights for us to start taking responsibility for what Jesus asked us to do, starting with the disciples to love one another. And it was so powerful for him that he repeats himself inside of that same comment at the end of what he tells the disciples, you know, hey, I want you to love each other. And then at the end, he says he repeats it again, like, I want to make sure you guys get this concept. I want to make sure you fully understand my expectations of what it's going to look like, what I need you to do when I leave here. So let's take a look at uh, the exercise. And we're going to start with... So um, hand out in front of you. Get it out in front of you. Get yourself a pen. And Dean, if you could come up and just, uh, we're going to have some soft, easy music for you. <laughs> just for a minute or two. But, and and your partner does not need any help with this. Okay, this is for you. Okay, so don't be filling in the blanks for them. But wherever the blank is, if you feel that you're that way in the relationship with the one you love, I want you to put your name there. If you're actively trying to be that way, like not just showing up once in a while, but actively really pursuing, you know, I'm not proud. And I make sure that I'm not proud of my marriage. Again, if you're not married, just take a look at it as, as who you are as a human. How do you show up for everybody else? And be honest with yourself. You know, the truth will set you free. And if you don't start with being truth about how you love or why you don't love or what's stopping you from loving, you're going to miss something today. This is a great opportunity for us to do a lifetime homework. I want you to consider this paper right here is your lifetime homework. Yes, it's a to target. be able to put my name on every single line so that I will be known by how I love. Yes. And that's not a bad homework assignment. You know, I've been working on this list really hard for the last 10 years, and I, I'm about 80%. <laughs> and I still got some work to do, and it's okay. Some of you won't be able to put your name anywhere. It's okay. You got a starting point. And, you know, having this family, having this church, having people around you that want to love you. You know, you're going to learn how to do this and put this into place. So, again, I want you to take a pen. We're going to take about two or three minutes here. And if you're online, just take a, a look at 1 Corinthians and see where you could or could not put your name. Replace love with your name. And we're going to give you just two or three minutes to do that. Yes, and before you guys, just really quick, you know, um, you know, check or put your name there in the kind area. Remember that kindness looks like everything that comes after that. Okay, if we're being kind, that means we're not being rude with each other. We're not being self-seeking. We're not easily angered. Okay, if we're being kind, we're not keeping records of wrongs. That means we're being more forgiving and more compassionate, right? We're being more trusting. So quickly, you know, just really think about that before you just mark the, the kindness. Just really look at what's underneath that. Okay, because again, if there's rudeness, if there's, you know, um, unforgiveness, if there's keeping records of wrongs and easily angered, that's really not what kindness looks like. Okay, especially you conflict avoiders. It looks like kindness sometimes, but, you know, I'd really challenge you to look at is it proactive? You know, the way it describes there, everything that's, at, that all the characteristics that's after patience and kindness, because that's what kindness looks like. So just think about it before you mark.
We'll have extra sheets of this in the back. We also have a table set up outside with all kinds of uh, paperwork and information. So if you want some extra ones to work on other relationships in your life, uh, maybe you want to do this one about your relationship with the Lord. You know, maybe you got some stuff missing there also. Okay, we're going to have you wrap it up. And we're going to talk about why this is important. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, And I give over my body to hardships that I may boast. But I do not have love. I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And it always perseveres. So look, this is big. This isn't, this isn't something small potatoes we're talking about. This is something that will forever change the way that you can relate to life and to love and everything else scripture tells us is, a, is almost like I don't want to say a joke but if we're not doing it with love we're missing something huge and if we don't know for sure what love is we now can say okay I know what it is and I know what's missing what's stopping me from being able to put my name there I, I want to I want to show up like Christ on this earth I really want to do that but in order to do that, I need to figure out maybe why I'm not. Why, why do I get easily angered? You know, what is it about me that I keep records of wrongs? We have to quit blaming other people why we can't put our name there. And so this journey is, is for each and every one of you to take a look at yourself. Look inside of yourself. For many of us, we have our reasons. It's someone else's fault that I'm not forgiving. It's someone else's fault that I, that I can't persevere. If I don't trust. It's someone else's fault that I don't trust. I trust. It's not my fault. Now we're called to love. Bottom line. And the journey is for us to figure out what's holding us back. And we're going to talk just a few minutes about some of the uh, reasons and situations in our life that has us uh, believe a lie. You know, John 10.10, 10, you know, we've heard this so many times. And sometimes we need to hear it one more time. You know, what's he do? He comes to lie, cheat, destroy. You see, if you can believe a lie, if you can believe a lie that says, you know what, I, don't, I, I can't trust. Well, that's not what love is. And so, if that's a lie and you're choosing to believe it, you've got some work to do. Right? But that's where the deceiver does his greatest work, is to get you to believe a lie that's not the truth, and yet live your life like somehow it is truthful. It's the greatest lie of all time. And so our journey today is just to maybe share with you maybe why you believe some certain things that you believe and maybe how to have you get some freedom around that. Okay, so we're going to just spend a few minutes to say, okay, what stops me from being able to put my name there? There's two things that exist. There's the spirit of fear and then there's the spirit of love. They can't live in the same house. 
I know Ralph and Joanne got a new house, right? Love and fear doesn't work very well. They don't live together very well, do they? Right? No, they just don't. And inside of our life, you know, fear is, is, is usually something that is around a lie, something we believe that's not the truth, but it feels like the truth. So we have to go on, again, a journey of saying, okay, what is the truth here and what is not the truth? What am I believing that's not truth that has me feel the way that I feel? So some of the things that you could be dealing with in the area of fear, you have a fear of rejection. And remembering here, guys, that um, what Scripture tells us in John 10, 10, it's the past that will hinder our future if we're not careful. And so this is what you want to be looking at as Don's sharing this and stuff is where does the fear come from? The fear comes from our evidence and our journey and our past and other people's sin and other people's lack of knowledge, you know, than our sin and our lack of knowledge, you know, but it really is all past-based. Anything that is a fear, it is, you know, just from the past. So you want to be looking at where would these fears come from? The fear of rejection, the fear of... Fear of being controlled, Mm -hmm. fear of not being listened to, fear of abandonment, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of not being good enough. That kind of hits for many, many people. At some level, I'm just not good enough, right? Um, Fear of not being able to trust, uh, uh, perhaps a wrong idea of God. Uh, because of your fears and see if we don't tell the truth about something the lie will always be our truth does that make sense to everybody Mm -hmm. see if we don't tell the truth about something a lie will always show up as the truth and I know some of these things are hard for us to hear today but that's why scripture tells us the truth is going to set you free the truth as far as what we can see in scripture is I'm called to love and I don't have any more love inside of me than any of you. The question is, why have I been unwilling to hold it back? What is stopping me from showing up as love for people, loving one another, praying for my enemies, forgiving those that hurt me? What is it about me that has me not be willing to release those attributes that live with inside of me? So we all have these things. It's not like you get a free pass and say, well, listen, I was just born with no compassion. Sorry. I'm sorry, my mom and dad didn't forgive, so I'm just an unforgiving person. That's my excuse. I'm sorry, I can't trust. You wouldn't believe what people have done to me. It's really easy to think that and get stuck in that fear and that false belief system, we call it. It really is easy to believe that, and we just want to challenge you today to to really look at what's there for you. You know, I used to laugh at people that share stories like I'm going to share with you right now. So I actually... uh, um, heard from the Lord, and I don't think I was ever listening for the first 40 years of my life, but I'm 54 now. So anyway, I had this event happen in my life, and and, uh, without going into all the details, the word from the Lord I got was this. He said, look, Don, if people would come to me at the point of impact, instead of waiting until they're in the mess of things, their lives would go a lot better. Now look, many of us, we wait until we get, we're in the mess, it's nasty, you know, we're, it's a, it's... The dirty fighting oh, times two, you know, this, the survival mode, right, the fighting, shutting down, running away, doing bad things because you're trying to flee for your problems, right, so all that dirty fighting, we call it vicious, nasty, survival mode crap, you know, that's what it's talking about, like getting so off track, you know, waiting until you're in the mess of things, that's what it looks like, you can imagine all of us in our marriages... We, I mean, start we got in a fight about bubble gum two weeks ago. I mean, how <laughs> stupid can that be, right? You know, it was all over. Bu- I mean, look, because why? Why he's not put it in the trash <laughs> instead of swallowing it, right? And, and you've had bubble gum fights. You know what I'm talking about. You, you get into this argument about the stupidest thing in the world, and then all of a sudden it's attached to this, it's attached to that, it's attached to what happened 12 years ago, it reminds me of this, and you're off on the rat race. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> bubblegum's a great one. But so we, we, it really was pitiful to see what happened to us, but it was all fear-based. It reminded me of something else from our past, and then it reminded me from something from childhood, and I was overly activated about what was being said. And the only thing that I've been willing to do that Angie, we've committed our lives to, is figuring out, okay, where are these lies coming from? What has me act and overreact to things that don't show love? And so a point of impact is this. When I'm activated, when you're activated, when you're upset, you got about a millisecond to make a decision. Are you going to operate from love? Or are you going to operate from fear? And fear owns a lot of real estate in the emotional part of your brain. 
Fear is going to collect all the evidence I ever knew about bubble gum with my wife. Now she's doing this, she's doing that. And my opinion about bubble gum, right. <laughs> and her opinions and her judgments. And, I mean, you just wouldn't believe it. It's like a choo-choo train that went through my brain and picked up every piece of evidence about how wrong she was about her comment that she just made. But it had nothing to do with the bubble gum. It had everything to do with the lies and the belief systems and my hurts and my pains and things that were associated to it. And, you know, I think scripture talks about, you know, when I was a child, I acted as a child, but now that I'm a man, I need to start acting like a man. Well, I was like five when we got in the bubblegum fight. (laughs) I was. But the only difference now is I realize I'm five. And I can make another choice. What we're committed to inside of what we do at Live the Life is to teach people how, at the point of impact, to believe what God says. Not to believe the liar. You see, the liar, he's got a lot of real estate. that he does. He's a squatter. Okay? And what a squatter does is he sits on land that doesn't belong to him. Okay? He, he, he's got some real estate that he says is his, and it's not his. But as a man thinks in his heart, so shall it be. You see, if you actually think that you're a victim, guess what? You're going to be a victim. If you actually think that you can't trust, that's your truth. That's how it's going to be for you. That's how powerful you've been designed. Whatever you say is, when I went on this journey, I can remember putting little sticky notes. Who I am is love, compassion, and forgiveness. And I'd stick it right there on my leg so I could remember who I was. Because I was so full of lies, I didn't know who I was. I had plenty of evidence to tell you that's just not true. There's no way that's true. Too many people have hurt me to believe there's any kind of truth in that. Mm-hmm. So this, each one of you is going to have a different journey around this. But it is up to you to say, hey, listen, I want what Jesus told the disciples. I want to be able to do that so that I can have all the, all the blessings that are attached to that. I want what love is so that I can experience the joy that comes with it. I'm tired of feeling unforgiving. I'm I'm tired of feeling that depression, that sadness. I'm tired of feeling that way. See, you're not designed to feel that way. That should be your first evidence that there's a lie. See, if you're uncomfortable with something like that, you know, you've got to be willing to dissect yourself like a frog and say, what is going on with me? When I'm mad and angry, first thing I do is, I'll, if I'm really upset, I'll go to the Lord and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I know this is not the way you want me to feel. I need some truth right now. That's not always the first thing he does. But <laughs> well, yeah, that's usually the second thing he does. <laughs> After I take it out on her. Okay. Yes, we're clear. We're being honest here. Okay. Darn it, I hate when she does that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then it really is twofold too, guys, because we are all wounded. We are all hurt. We all do have fears from our life's journey, right? So the key in relationship, and we're not just talking about marriage here, but all relationships, right, is how do you bring love to someone who is hurting, right? You know, so the things that trigger and upset, you know, Don, for example, here is not the same things that trigger and upset me, right? But how I'm being with him, it's like what we've had to learn is two wrongs will never equal a right, right? So if he's hurt and triggered and reactive or whatever, and if I start giving him what he deserves at the moment, right, instead of loving him the way he needs it, right, well, we have a hard time getting off track, you know, and that's what you're going to find in relationship, that we're all hurt, we're all wounded, we're all dealing with struggles, right? But how can you be used by God to bring love and caring and healing and um, compassion and, um, and restoring um, his love for people, you know? So it's, again, it's more motivation just to get on track doing the right thing because it does make a difference. And like I said, we're all wounded and we're all hurt and we're all triggered and we're going to have these things that happen every day, right? But how do we really get, be used by God? And I, I'm just telling you, over and over, and this is what we teach our couples all the time, it's like when I'm choosing to have um, empathy and compassion for my husband in those moments when he's being so reactive, I'm telling you, I have never felt more like being like Jesus ever. I mean, that is it. I mean, that's like really walking out your faith, that spirit of faith instead of spirit of fear. And um, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to try to do that, to be compassionate when you're hurting too, right? But just understanding if we can get this concept that people aren't, you know, being that way just because they want to hurt you and they don't love you, right? They really are just operating from hurts and fears. And it's just really an opportunity then to really walk out your faith, right? To, you know, it's that point of impact, walking out your, the spirit of faith instead of the spirit of fear. And it is a choice. You know, what they've talked about in the little video here, what is love? We don't understand. And a lot of times we think it's just a feeling. It's supposed to just happen. It's going to come upon us, right? But it's not that point of impact gives us the opportunity to choose, to choose God's way. 
and to choose his love and choose, you know, Christ-like attributes. And the sad truth is it's not going to come automatically for most of us. It is a choice. You know, we teach a class called Soul Healing Love, and we invite you to come join us. We do it about every six weeks mm-hmm. at Marriage and Family Works and Live the Life. Let me just share what a soul wound looks like. Uh, I'll share one from my life. You know, and this is where lies come from, right? At seven years old, I was beaten for something really badly that I didn't do. And it was a pretty horrendous beating. And uh, from ever, since that day, and I'm 54 years old now, if I feel falsely accused by Angie, I go into a meltdown. So what does that look like? That I get triggered because I feel like she's falsely accusing me like my dad did for stealing something I didn't steal. I feel like I'm about ready going to get beat or in trouble or something is just not right here. So I way overreact to the circumstance. Because usually I'm just asking a question, maybe just in a way just to kind of get an answer, right? Just, I'm just looking, you know, and I'm, my fear sometimes asks me, you know, has me ask the question in a little bit more of a confrontational way. You know, I have to be responsible for that. But usually I am just asking him a question and then he overreacts. He overreacts. overresponds to. A second soul wound I have. My dad was an alcoholic and his beer was always much more important than the family or myself. And now whenever something <clears throat> in our relationship shows up for me as it's more important than me, I go into a meltdown if I'm not being responsible because I'm, I'm, I'm making Angie pay the price for my dad's addiction. You see, it was always more important for him, so now when I feel like I'm not important to Angie, it reminds me of what my own father did to me. These are soul wounds. This is why it's so important for us to get some knowledge, get some understanding. It's, you don't have to lay on a couch and get electrodes. We're going to just have conversations with you, okay? You know, what has, what are your triggers? Mm-hmm. You know, what has the bubble gum be such a big deal for you? Mm-hmm. What has, when Angie asked me a question, why is it? You know, and for Angie, if she would share one or two little wounds that she has, and we're going to kind of end with this, and just, and it's an invite for you. If you really want to figure this stuff out, it's going to take some help. Mm-hmm. And we want to help you. That's what we're here for. And I know Ralph and Joanne, they have that commitment to help you. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're all here to help you deal with and figure, get rid of the lies. So Angie, you want to share one or two soul wounds that you have? Yeah, so one that really shows up big time in, in, um, in our marriage actually is uh, um, the fact that my parents divorced when I was four, so my dad left our life at that time period and stuff. So that did create a lot of wounds in me, the fear of abandonment, the fear of rejection, the fear of not being good enough and not special and not loved. And it's amazing how that will show up a lot of times in just how Don's being, you know, in his with his personality and stuff, you know, and it will trigger wounds in me and I will overreact very easily. And I've had to really learn how to deal with that. And he's had to learn how to love me in ways that bring healing in that area and stuff. But that's a big one. And my big one with the whole, why I naturally automatically go into shutdown mode is because of my upbringing, right? I had a mom that was very confrontational and stuff. And so anytime Don comes to me and wants to deal with an issue in our marriage, right, which we have to, I immediately go to, you know, I'm not doing it right. I'm not good enough. I feel like he's just being confrontational. And I, the fear takes over with me instead of love, be present and let's just deal with our life stuff, right? So it's just, it's those fears that kick in automatically. We get emotionally hijacked because of whatever those fears are that we're feeling at the moment. And then we just overreact and over respond. Here's what I want to leave you with today. You know, we all hear about mission fields, right? Mm -hmm. Going on a mission. I want everyone to consider, even those of you online today, that look, my first mission is to heal my Mm -hmm. wife. And if she's got soul wounds, part of my job is to be responsible and help her become not afraid of what happened to her from her past. Help her get rid of the lies. And so it's, if I I heal my wife, I heal myself. If she helps heal me, she gets the healing. Consider it's an opportunity for you. If you want to go on this journey to figure out, instead of thinking my wife's wacko, she's a jealous freak. To instead understand. of treating me the way I deserve to be treated at the moment, right? <laughs> it's learning how to treat each other the way we need to be treated at those moments. And caring and having empathy. Mm-hmm. So we're going to leave you with a small video. And we want to thank you for letting us talk to you about love today. I do want to share one thing. Uh, Angie wants to share Just one more quick, thing. Just real quick, a couple things on the table that we have in the back here. Again, what helped us in the beginning when we try to get you know, restoration and God's truth back in our life, it was just really having some reminders. So on the back table, if you guys want to pick up this, this is actually just walk. It's it, what it says to walk out the fruit of the Spirit, the, the Spirit of love, right? Because, again, just remembering leaving here today is that we're all equipped with it. Okay, we're not asking you guys to, to learn how to be patient, to learn how 
how to be generous with each other, to learn how to be forgiving and stuff. It's like really and truly believing that this is in every single one of us. And what it says here is that love is just patient, kind, gentle, um, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, compassion, forgiveness, perseverance. This is in all of us, right? So this is just a target to take home with you as a reminder, just to be on track to really releasing this stuff on a daily basis, because it is in every single one of us. We just have to choose to see that there's a fear on top of it that's keeping us from walking out the spirit of faith. Okay, if we could have that video, please. Wow, that was great. Thank We're going to take you, up an offering you. in just a few minutes uh, to invest into uh, Live the Life, Marriage and Family Works. reason why we do this, and they didn't ask for this, we just said we really feel like we need to invest in. Nobody is ever turned away that goes there for help. So if people don't have money, they're still going to get help. These are people that have laid their lives down to doing everything they can to get people's lives together and their marriages together. The success rate is so large that, um, that every time that families come in, their, their lives are rebuilt. And so with that, we're going to take up an offering, but we're going to just uh, pray a couple prayers. There's here. first just a couple things I just want to pray over you. I, I think that um, was an amazing uh, message for each and every one of us. I think we all have those things. Um, that we want revealed in our lives and in our past that God can heal. So I want us all just to just take a moment. I just want to pray over all of us that God would reveal those things to us so that we don't have to keep being triggered by those pains, but instead that um, as we think about this message today and as we go through the process and 
um, that God will show us. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I just thank you so much for this message. Thank you, God, that you have shown us what love is. And not only that, but that you have given us the ability to walk in it. And that um, your word brings truth. And that we can shut down the lies of the enemy. So, Father, right now, I just pray that you would give each one of us open eyes. Lord, I pray that we would connect with godly relationships as well. That where we can help each other find what your true love is is, that we can uh, heal from past hurts. So Lord, right now in Jesus' name, that your love would be a healing balm on people. Lord, that as things come up and as revelations of past lies and fears comes um, to our mind and to, to us, that we would be able to use you and your word and your love as that band-aid over it. God, that it'll help us walk into truth, into wholeness, and into a place of healing. And we just thank you for that now in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And this is time of prayer. And maybe you're here and, and, and you don't know the Lord. Maybe you said, man, I got that list and, and I couldn't put my name on any part of that. That's all okay. The Bible says that God, while we were yet in all of the mess in our life, God chose to love you and I. And if you're here today and you don't know God as your Lord and Savior, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to pray a prayer with you. It's the most powerful prayer in the Bible that you can pray. The Bible says that if you speak it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, that he'll come in to you. Come into your life and change it from the inside out. That's the first step to having God's love operate in your life. And maybe you've never prayed it or you've prayed it once before, but you said, man, my life, I have gone off the tracks and I've missed this. I want to pray this prayer with you. Whether you're in this auditorium, I want you to speak it out loud with me. Or you're watching online change your life today. The greatest gift you can give yourself is making Jesus your Lord. The prayer goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Jesus. Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my life. Change my life. Change my life. Make it fresh. Make it fresh. Make it new. Make it new. Help me to live. Help me to live. For you. For you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I would love if you would just take that card, that um, Are You Visiting card, and on the back it says, Today I Prayed That Prayer. Would you check off that box? And then you can just drop this in the basket as you leave at the door. But we want to make sure we help you follow up. There's, um, this is step one. And just like Don and Angie had said, you need people around you to help you in the journey. I would love to tell you that you pray that prayer and now everything is poof, perfect. It's all going to be awesome, but it's a journey and we need to walk it together. So um, do let us know. And I encourage you, give us six to eight months here at the church. Keep coming. Let us help you in the journey. And I guarantee you that God will do something amazing in your life. And um, if you do need prayer, you need to talk to someone in our living room area. We have a resource center there. And um, we would love uh, to have those people. They have prayer team badges on. They would love to talk to you. Uh, In Winnipeg, you've got your leaders there. Please talk to them. If you have any um, prayer requests, any issues, they're there for you. Um, They want to be in your life praying and believing God alongside of you. So do you want to pray over this offering and over um, Absolutely. Their, the, oh, this ministry? Over live the life. You know, the great we, we get gifts in our lives. Sometimes it comes by way of a package. Sometimes it's by way of people coming into your life. Are you with me? People will show up into your life and all of a sudden you're thinking, my God, these are the people that I just needed. When we met this couple, I said, this couple is a gift to the community. And I sat there and I watched how they just can continue to pour their life into people. And I, I sat there amazed. I thought, you know, they're, they're not pastoring a church, but here they are taking the gifts and the abilities, the hurts, the talents that God has given them, and they're pouring them into people's lives to see lives restored. So if you're here and you're saying, well, I really could use some helper. I'm not even married. How is this going to help me? I'm going to tell you, the more you learn, 
the better you put, pull yourself together, the better it is. And if you can't afford to, they won't turn you away. But see, this gives us an opportunity as a church to invest into what's happening in our community. This is local. This doesn't get any closer to home than where we're at. And each and every one of us know people in our lives that unfortunately have gone through divorce and have gone through the hurts of all of that. But I just want to pray over this offering. I want you to give what God tells you to give. Invest into our community and let God just show up. And if you're making checks payable, they're made payable to the source church and we will get a check to them online as well. You can give. Just click the connect button. And allow God just to get involved in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, and see what's going to happen. Father, I thank you for each and every person. Lord, I pray that you'd bless each gift and each giver as they give. Father, I thank you for live the life in our community. I thank you for the effectiveness it's already had. But Lord, I pray, Lord, now that you would open the doors and even have it more effective in the lives of people, in their marriages, in their families. Thank you for restoring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Read your bulletins. There's lots of stuff going on. Um, We need Easter egg help. Uh, Stuffing. I know. Um, We've got Easter egg candy that we need as well as people helping stuff. Let us know. I think we have 12,000 Easter eggs to fill. Let us know. Also, uh, next Sunday... Uh, My son Brett and I are leading a team to Winnipeg as we finally uh, take possession of a location there and are going to get ready for our soft launch on March 30th. And so um, we're going to be, I think there's about six or seven of us going, and um, I appreciate the 20-somethings team that are helping us big time and coming, and they're taking it as a missions trip and heading up with us. But um, we need, we are sending a truck full of chairs and supplies to Winnipeg that leaves first thing Thursday morning. So Tuesday night and all day Wednesday, we are going to need help packing that truck. Um, So if you can bring some muscle help, we could use you. Uh, We've got to be strategic, get as much stuff in there as possible to be able to bless the Winnipeg campus. Um, after five on Tuesday. So if you can, uh, we would love to see you. Um, it would be awesome. And um, the retreat, the She Retreat, coming up really soon. We've got that in one, two, three weeks. So next Sunday is our deadline. So you need to have your registration fee in with your registration form to hold your spot. If you are needing um, sponsorship, there's a, a waiting list right now. So you can fill out your name out. Um, on that waiting list. If you would like to sponsor some ladies to go, we would love, love, love for you to be part of that um, so that we have a long list already of women waiting to come. Uh, So if you'd like to do that, go to the information desk. You can give them um, your check there to help sponsor someone, and we will uh, make some women very happy, and we'll have a really life-impacting weekend. So um, we're just going to finish off with praying over petitions. Uh, So do you want to? I can I'll do it. I'll do it. So grab out your petition forms. We are going to pray. And we just so believe in the power of prayer and where two or more agree touching anything. So we believe in joining our faith together. So let's get those and let's believe that God can actually do something absolutely amazing in our lives. Father, I just thank you right now for every request that is on these forms. Lord, I thank you, God, that you aren't a God who just answers, but who does it exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. So Lord, for every situation that's represented in these requests, I pray that you would move things in their favor. Lord, that you would navigate situations, God, that you would open doors that need to be open and close doors that need to be closed. I also pray right now that you would give each person godly wisdom as they need to navigate through situations, Lord, that they would have your heart and your mind to be able to walk this out into a miraculous end. We thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Um, Also, remember Wednesday night, Growth Groups is still on, and we'll see you next Sunday. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.